Sure. So um, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. Um, essentially, we have been for the past year working on creating a 2030 group in Tucson, um, and we are at the emerging status. So we're doing a lot of outreach to different groups that are established to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, you know, we're kind of going through the growing pain stage right now. We're, to give you a little background, we're an all-volunteer group. We don't have any paid staff. Uh, we don't really have funding yet. Um, so we're, all, all those big questions are things, you know, that we're working on. Um, so I just wanted to kind of start off a little bit, and if you guys can tell me, like, the history of the Pittsburgh 2030, um, how it was started, and by whom it was started, that would be great. Sure, I can definitely do that. Really quickly, could you just kind of explain to me the roles of the different folks that are on the phone so I kind of understand who I'm, who I'm talking to? That'd be helpful. Oh, sure. So um, I think if we just all introduce ourselves, that'd be great. Um, so my yeah, name is Colleen. Good. I'm, uh, I'm the program, program development director for an organization called Local First Arizona, um, which works across the state with locally owned businesses, encouraging them, uh, promoting them and supporting them, and also encouraging them to embrace sustainable behavior. Great. Um, I am, Linda, you want to? Yeah, yeah. I'm Linda Eleanor. Uh, I'm a uh, professional consultant here in Tucson. I do organization development work and um, very interested in climate change. Um, so that's why I'm on this call. I'm on the executive committee along with Helene. And uh, yeah, that's me. Hey. Hi, I'm Deborah Chaw. I'm with Smart Loss. I'm a general contractor and I do uh, green infill for residential. Um, buildings in Tucson. I've had a background in real estate and development over the past 30 years locally and have an interest in continuing with more green, sustainable building. I'm on the membership task committee. Got it. That's helpful. Um, so just to give you a bit of background about who I am too before I get into the district because I am relatively new to the Pittsburgh 2030 district um, on this side of things that is so I've just kind of passed my six month mark in this role as the director here but prior to that I was on the property partner side so most recently I was at PNC Bank managing the the green building uh, portfolio there and then prior to that I was with our local authority here in Pittsburgh that owns our convention center and professional sports stadiums. So I was, um, you know, one of the founding members of the 2030 district in my previous role. So I've, I've been an active participant before coming over to this side. So I have a little bit of, a, of an idea on the formation and hopefully we'll be able to fill in some gaps and be helpful, but just wanted to give you some perspective that I wasn't actually in all of those original meetings, but they were courting me at the time. So I know, <laughs> I kind of know the yeah. tactics that were being used and things like that. That's great. So, um, so the Pittsburgh 2030 district, I mean, how familiar are you guys with it? Should I just kind of start and kind of go into all of it? Yeah, if you want to, if you can give a brief overview, that would be great. I have spent sure. some time on the website, but didn't really dig in. Great. So we uh, started back in 2012, and we are an initiative of Green Building Alliance which is an environmental nonprofit focused on healthy and high performing uh, buildings. We've, the GBA has been around um, for almost 25 years. So we had significant um, partners that were already established through the fact that we're part of GBA and not our own organization. And I know that that varies depending on who you talk to. GBA is also an aligned chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council. So we are affiliated with USGBC as well. So that's kind of um, where there we're one of four major initiatives the GBA has here in Pittsburgh, and we the reason why we started developing the district was was because we saw this need to engage with our existing buildings here in Pittsburgh. We don't have we especially at the time didn't have a ton of new development happening and. Um, you know, LEED is typically associated with new construction, so we weren't giving buildings an opportunity to really say, wait, but I'm green too, like I'm doing something too. And so, um, you know, we see the value in the 2030 district of providing that opportunity for folks to be under that umbrella and also to create a peer-to-peer -peer network for them to get more information from each other and 
you know, a little bit of the secret sauce is also around peer pressure, right? Because when mm-hmm. you see that all of the others in your sector are participating, you don't want to be the only one that's not. Um, so th- that's kind of a little bit of the background. Uh, when they Thanks. were originally start- starting the district, they actually went around to individual property owners that were mostly large portfolio owners. Um, they focused first on like the public agencies, so the city, the county, and then public agencies like the one that I worked for, the Sports and Exhibition Authority that owned, you know, big facilities that people recognize as important. I mean, I think getting the sports teams on board was a big win um, and kind of driving driving more people to want to say, oh, wait, this is something that we should look at. Uh, we also had a very... Um, strong relationship from the start with our local utilities so with our electric and gas and water utilities uh, trying to get their buy-in and also to have them uh, be able to assist us as we tried to navigate the difficult complexities associated with collecting data (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how things got started then we had an initial launch event um, at the end of 2012, where we had everybody get up in front of uh, of an audience at this like nice launch event and say, you know, I'm so and so with the Sports and Exhibition Authority, and I'm committing the David L. Lawrence Convention Center, which is one in 0.5 million square feet. So it, it was kind of fun to see all the founding partners get up there and and talk about, um, you know, what their buildings were, and you got to really everybody in the room could really feel the momentum behind it because mm-hmm. we had really picked off so many of those huge buildings right at the beginning. That's awesome. So with, um, just to touch on the utility relationship a little bit, were yeah. you able to access like um, energy data on buildings through them or did you still have to go through the building owners to get that information? We still had to go through the building owners. Unfortunately, that's like you know, always been a bit of a struggle. One thing that we did work out with the utilities was that, you know, at that time, there wasn't a lot of smart meter data. And I don't know what it's like in Tucson, but basically, if you weren't keeping track of your electricity bills, like that was just like tough, there was no way for you to easily access that online. So we worked with the utilities to kind of pull stuff from the back end when an owner would sign, you know, some kind of thing saying, yeah, I give Green Building Alliance the, uh, the approval to view my bills from this period to this period and then they would send us the information in like an excel format rather than us trying to go you know they're like oh well you know somebody in archives has it in some other building from six years ago and we're like okay that's not really that useful to us sure, so, sure. The, so the utilities were able to at least help us wrap our hands around um, some of that historic data and also for the folks that weren't tracking usage at all now today that's it's the the situation has definitely evolved because the smart meters are now um, being they're being rolled out widely so everybody now has access to all that information online so instead our, our relationship is now kind of um, mostly related to the energy efficiency rebates that the utility gives out so we help to heavily connect them with folks that are interested in the rebates and then we also help them roll out things around um, you know, just like consumer education on the fact that you can get all this information online and, and how to kind of use that and all those types of things. So it's kind of an, a constantly evolving relationship with them. Gotcha. Um, and then when when the district started, um, tell me a little bit about what that what the structure was. Was there a board? Was there paid staff? Yes. So we had um, one 2030 district director when we, well, that's not true. Actually, when they first started, it was two GBA staff people that were working on it. So one of them um, was our vice president of innovation, who's actually now our executive director of GBA. And then the other one was actually GBA's executive director at the time. They were the ones that were going out and like pounding the pavement, meeting with with property owners in our downtown district. Mm -hmm. So um, after that, um, probably maybe a month after the launch of the district, and I think it launched in October 2012, and then in November 2012, they brought on the first 2030 district director at like a nice big splashy event. 
Um, mm-hmm. And they actually brought somebody in that previously had done some work in Pittsburgh and was very, very connected with the real estate community because um, that's kind of the work that he did when he was here. Um, he then hired a full-time staff person probably maybe three or four months later to help with the data collection because that was not necessarily his wheelhouse. He was more um, doing the recruitment side of things and kind of managing that piece of it. And then um, about a year and a half ago, we hired a third staff person and her role is basically all of the partner engagement coordination. So from organizing all of our partner meetings, which we do on a monthly basis, and we kind of have those all over within the district. So, you know, for example, last, last month we were at PNC Park, so our kind of baseball stadium here, and they talked about their LED lighting upgrade project that they did for their sports lights. We had somebody come in and t- um, from a, one of the DOE national labs to talk about a Pittsburgh-centered report they did, and then we do a building tour. So we hold those once a month, and the content changes, varies pretty significantly, actually. And so Quinn's main role is to facilitate um, those meetings and curate who's going to be there and then just, you know, c- keeping <laughs> keeping the wheels going. Um, you know, right sure. now we're in the process of going through our, on an annual basis, we also have one-on-one meetings with each of our, well, we try to do it with each of our partners. That's increasingly becoming more and more difficult. Um, and Quinn is the one that manages all the organization of that, follow-up and all those types of things. So, And how many members do you guys have? Um, we have a hundred. We have a hundred and three property partners. Um, we also have a number of community and resource partners. So the way that we're structured is, we've got the hundred and three property partners, which account for like four hundred and ninety-one buildings or something like that, almost eighty million square feet. So we are the the largest of the twenty thirty districts in terms of square footage committed to the goals. Um, and I definitely attribute most of that to the fact being that we were inside Green Building Alliance, which had already established those relationships. You know, we weren't kind of like, hey, guess who we are? (laughs) Right, right. Come join this thing. Oh, also give us all your data that you don't want to give people. (laughs) Um, So that helped. But um, wait, what was I answering? I just got excited and lost. Uh, (laughs) You were talking about uh, the the property partners and then community partners as well. So we also have community partners, which are our nonprofit organizations in Pittsburgh that are doing something along the lines of the 2030 related project. So whether that's um, our urban redevelopment authority that does all the redevelopment in the city or our port authority here that does all of our buses or somebody like uh, an environmental nonprofit, transportation nonprofit, stormwater nonprofits, pretty much everybody that's doing any kind of related work that can help our partners. So we wanna kind of drive people to them and then also use them as a resource. In addition Mm -hmm. to that, we have what we call resource partners, which are pretty much just our utilities. So our electric and gas utility, uh, our water authority, and then our utilities, uh, uh, district energy assets, that we have here in Pittsburgh, they're also involved. Then Do you have top, any... Oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was just going to mention something about sponsors um, because they're kind of the other component of that. So we have 12, we have 12, 14 sponsors. I should know that. I don't know. Somewhere between 12 and 14. <laughs> um, that, so we have kind of one title sponsor that's been on board since the very beginning. Uh, at a pretty high level. Then we have one that's a little bit lower. We have two program sponsors, and then we have 10 meeting sponsors who are the kind of the lower level people um, that have given to the organization. And the reason why people, one of the main things that drives um, sponsorship, other than the fact that they want to be affiliated with the district, is that they get invitations to our partner meetings, which are closed door. So they're the only Mm -hmm. folks that are in the room that are basically selling something, although we're very careful about making sure that they're not cornering people and selling people things. Um, Mm -hmm. But they at least get to be in the room and show, you know, all of our partners that they're real humans and they should do work with them. So sure. I think that's been fruitful for them. Yeah, that's great. Um, Can you go into a little bit of the funding structure? So um, I think you, you're probably 
quite a bit different from some of the other 2030 districts that we've talked to just because uh, you know, you do have that connection to the the Green uh, Building Alliance, um, but you know, we're we're hearing from different things. You know, there's a few districts that are actually charging members, um, but a lot are dealing with like grants and sponsorships and that sort of thing. So, can you go a little bit into how you guys are funded? Sure. Yes, we do not charge our property uh, partners, so it is completely free for them to be part of the district. And I think that's one of the real that's actually one of the um, you know real reasons why a lot of people participate because it's access to free resources um, that they wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. Our funding comes from the sponsors that I mentioned, as well as um, our operational grants that we get from the local foundations here in Pittsburgh. So a lot of that is actually just funneled through Green Building Alliance. I think we only have maybe one grant that was specific to 2030, and the rest of them are just pieces of um, funding that we get for the larger organization. Okay. I'm just taking a few notes. No, that's fine. Sorry, I was sitting in a hotel lobby. I feel like, is this better? Is this less, like, it's really loud out there for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> is this, less, is this better? Can you guys hear me better? Yes, so. it does sound a little bit better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, okay. we can hear you fine. I did have a question okay. on funding, just to follow up a little bit. So it sounds like you get most of your fund, like you don't hardly even worry about it because green, the Green Building Alliance just takes care of that for you, or are you spending part of your time actually applying for grants and going to other donors? No, we are. So I would say, you know, it's really hard for me to tell you what percentage of my time is 2030 district and what part of it is GBA because there's so much there's so much overlap between those roles. So I'm actively involved in fundraising conversations with GBA, um, not only for our program, but for other programs that we have as well. So I'm kind of one of the, you know, one of the folks that is out there doing grant writing. We do have a development um, director and relationship director. So um, development and relationship director is one person. So he is the one that actually you know, really facilitates those sponsorship relationships and our our uh, relationships with the foundations and handles most of the grant writing, but I do a significant portion of that as well and definitely am expected to be there to, you know, meet people, talk about the work that we're doing and things like that. But the nice thing about having him kind of outside of me is that then I don't have to have all of those money conversations with sponsors, which can get a little weird. Um, so, you know, we have kind of the initial conversation and then Ryan kind of takes it from there. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. I have a and question. then for any of the, whoops. Oh, go ahead, Deborah. Uh, Why we're, we're close to the topic of sponsors. Could you identify who your major sponsors are? Are they lenders? Um, are they, are they local businesses? Could you give us an idea of who? who sure. Are yeah. Yes, and all of the, like, you can um, find word, more info on this, too, on our website. Um, but we, so our, our major sponsor, our, like, largest title sponsor is the Efficiency Network. Um, they are an ESCO, so an energy services company. We have a lot of interest from ESCOs, which I imagine you'll find as well, because these are, like, their core folks that they want to reach. Um, our second largest sponsor is Covestro, which is a company that makes a lot of materials that go, I mean, basically they make all the things, like uh, they're mostly plastics and chemicals, um, but it, the, the real tie in there is, first of all, they're a Pittsburgh company, um, but second of all, they do a lot around insulation and um, envelope related items, so we've had mm -hmm. a long-term relationship with them. Um, our two next level sponsors are Stantec, which is an architecture and engineering firm, kind of a nationwide firm, but they have a pretty heavy local presence. And then Scott Electric, who does um, lighting supply. So they, they supply, yeah, lighting fixtures and, and uh, lamps. Could you give us just kind of an idea of the range in which you get, what, what type of um, investment is that for your top to lowest sponsor, what the range is? Sure. So our lower sponsors are like under five thousand, and then our our higher sponsors are you know between ten and twenty. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
how does the university participate and do you get students and classes and interns and continue accessing yeah that's a great question we have a very um a very close relationship with our university community so carnegie mellon university and the university of pittsburgh are probably the two that we have the closest relationship with um and they're there's certainly some research components of the work that we do that they um, that they participate in, you know, whether we kind of provide a letter of support for funding that they're trying to go after or vice versa. So we do work with them. They're also property partners. Um, so, you know, they're some of our largest chunks of square footage are coming from the universities. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're active in a number of different ways. So um, I would say that that's been a really key component of what we've done as well, because we also have a couple smaller institutions like Point Park University, Carlo University, who are in our, um, our local uh, community college, um, which we're trying to establish a relationship with. So we definitely see universities as a key piece of what we do. And certainly a lot of our interns, we also typically have an intern um, working with us as well and so the interns are usually coming from one of those schools right right thank you mm -hmm. uh, one other and, thought and so was, you didn't mention any lenders or finance companies do they play a role uh, no other than for uh, property partners <laughs> so okay. we have a number of financial institutions that participate at the property partner level but that's it okay thank you mm -hmm. And Angelica, can you kind of um, walk us through like what happens when some when a property partner joins? Um, so like, how are they? How do you communicate with them? What is like the first priority? Sure. So um, we meet people in so many different ways uh, because sometimes they're typically some type of warm introduction. So whether it's somebody that we've already engaged with, who is then introducing us to someone, or um, you know, we have some that are kind of on our, you know, on our hit list that we haven't gotten to yet. And so we would try to find somebody that has done work with them that we can utilize to try to, to try to get in with them. But there are definitely some times where people come to us. Um, those are the, that's the most fun when that happens. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I wish that happened more often, but, um, we basically have kind of an initial recruitment meeting with them where we talk about all the services that we can provide. Um, you know, definitely uh, our two biggest things that we emphasize there is that there's no cost to participate and that we will keep all of their data confidential. Those are kind of the two key components. And then, mm -hmm. you know, as far as onboarding goes, um, Isaac, who is our data person, will get in touch with them to set up a portfolio manager account and get some information on their utility bills and their building characteristics. Sometimes that can actually be very hard to nail down, like the actual square footage of a building and what the different use types are within that building. Those types of things actually end up taking a good bit of time. Mm -hmm. Angelica, do, do your interns help you with that data collection, the portfolio manager, or who actually helps these members do that? They, um, so a little bit. Actually, Isaac and Quinn do most of it. So, you know, the other two folks on our staff, Isaac is the, the main person that's focused on data. He's our building performance analyst. Um, and he will actually, like people will actually sometimes mail him bills and he inputs them, which I realize is not the most effective way to do that. But there are still some folks that haven't fully taken ownership of benchmarking their buildings. Um, that's definitely decreased over time. Although when we're onboarding a new, when we're onboarding a new property partner, we definitely want to give them that extra level of attention. So I wouldn't send an intern, like I would send Isaac to actually have like a, a good thorough conversation about data and things like that. But certainly um, all of us <laughs> end up working with that in one way or another. Do they pay charge for that benchmarking in the initial? No, no, it's all free. Don't. It's all free. Yeah. Okay. What do you think that costs the organization for a, <laughs> a, a thousand, you know, whatever, a thousand square foot building? 
Uh, yeah, probably a lot of staff time. I mean, when we're talking about some of these major buildings that are, you know, our biggest and probably most successful cohort of participants are our office buildings that are greater than 200,000 square feet. Right. And in order to get a handle on their data, if they haven't been doing that already, I mean, that's definitely significant hours worth of work for sure. Um, but, you know, if we do it right and we kind of hand pull it a little bit and teach them how to do it, then hopefully we can let it go. And that's what we've seen. You know, maybe we have the first year that we're doing it. And then over time, typically from their side, an admin will take over uh, on the actual data inputting. But there's still a lot of them are still relying on us to do the report. Well, we, we are giving them a report annually either way, but they're not necessarily pulling those reports themselves. They're pretty much waiting for us to give it to them. Okay, so you're offering no cost benchmarking, basically. Basically, yes. Okay. okay. What do your um... yeah, and you know, one of the things that we are always balancing is GBA because we do have a lot of technical folks on staff and provide a lot of technical assistance as well. Is like the balance of what we should do and then what we actually hand over to the private market. Um, so for this, we realized that the appetite wasn't even there to do it. Like people weren't seeing the value in it. So we had to prove the value by giving them the service for free. Uh, and then we kind of hand things off to the private market after that. So, you know, when they want to do like a full energy audit or something, like we won't do that. We would right. ask, we would tell them to hire somebody, even though like secretly I would love to do that, but we won't, <laughs> we won't do that. <laughs> um, but we will, you know, walk through their building, walk through their data stuff with them and say, here's some things you should think about that you should explore further. Like, oh, look, we're noticing spikes in these months. Maybe that means X, Y, Z, and you should look at whatever. Or like you have a high base load. That maybe means that you have a lighting um, opportunity or something. So we do try to at least get them excited about stuff and then pass it over to the private market. And how do you handle that, Angelica? Do, do, they, do you have like a, a vendor list that you vet for, that for your owners or how, how does that work? Uh, basically, we have a list, which we need to update, but we do have a list on our website. Um, people do not pay or anything to be on that list. Those are just folks that we know that are out there that are doing work in the Pittsburgh market. We don't necessarily go through any kind of vetting process, although I can say that the ones that are on there now and the ones that we plan to put on are all people that we've had contact with before. Like, they're not just, like, random people that we pulled off the internet, necessarily. Uh -huh. Um so we try to, when we're suggesting like an engineer, an architect, or a sustainability consultant, we either point them there or give them three um, folks that we would recommend because we don't, we don't ever want to be pushing them to one person. And we make that very clear in our sponsorship agreements too, that like, we will not give you favoritism in terms of getting projects. Right. So we have to continue to stay neutral because that's one of the things that um, allows us to do all the work that we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. And it, it allows new newcomers to enter on a, on a level playing field too. Exactly. But, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah. And like, actually we'll, they'll reach out to us. Like a company will reach out to us and say, Hey, we're now in the Pittsburgh market or we're trying to do this. Can we just talk to you? So, you know, probably at least two times a week, I just have like a phone call or coffee or an in-person meeting with a company that's doing whatever and just wants to better understand where the market is and, you know, what types of opportunities there are for them and then ask us to maybe put them on the website or, you know, maybe I hand them off to Ryan and they become a GBA member. Um, but you don't have to be a GBA member to be part of the 2030 district. And then uh, you had mentioned, I think, that you have one staff person pretty much uh, devoted to managing your meetings, your member meetings. So you, have, yes. so you have monthly member meetings. Do you have any other kinds of events during the year? Yeah. So once a year, we do our annual progress report reception, which we just had at the end of April. And that's where we release the report in aggregate, which is on our website, too, um, if you want to take a look at it. That's kind of evolved over time. This is our fourth report that we've released. Um, as you can imagine, that's a pretty significant undertaking to get that all out and printed by the end of April because we're, you know, constantly chasing people to put their data in. 
<laughs> and then, um, so that's one major event that we have. So like for our partner meetings, we have between 40 and 70 people, depending on the location for the progress report reception. This year we had, I think, 197 or something like that. So we always have like about 200 people at that event. And that one is in the afternoon, there's like drinks and hors d'oeuvres. Um, and it's free for partners to attend, but it's, it's open to the public. So anybody can come and, um, for that event. And we do have separate sponsorship for that. Um, for our partner meetings, we do them at breakfast. So we always have like a warm breakfast. <laughs> uh, like we're, we're, that's one of the big draws to believe it or not, is like to have like good coffee and good food and not just like sad pastries um, or sad donuts. So we try to like really feed people and bring them to cool places. And we have those from eight to 10 every third Tuesday. Cool. The other thing that we've done in the past, uh, the past two years, were educational series that were um, kind of co-branded with GBA. And so those were open to the public. Um, last year, the series was called Race to Zero Energy. And we had one on passive strategies, one on water, one on financing, and one on transportation. Um, and then this year, we're planning to do that a little differently. Uh, we're four times a year, though, we're going to plan to co-brand an event with our um, education director at GBA and try to bring our partners there to get them to come to more GBA events because you know GBA is like 120 events a year or something like that it's, wow. it's a lot we have one to two education events every week um actually I, yeah I just went to one last night <laughs> so those are kind of always happening um and we want so we want to have that more cross-pollination between our property partners and our GBA members and then we also you know, want to provide people an opportunity who want to participate in the district, but maybe aren't in the right location or just can't participate for any number of reasons and give them a way to, to still feel like they're part of, part of it. Very good. Oh, let's see. Financing, I think we covered that pretty well. Um, so if you had to say in terms of your value proposition in Pittsburgh to your members, what, what do you think are the top, what, you know, how would you articulate your value proposition to them? Well, I think those have changed over time. I think when we were first looking at it, we were really talking about the economic competitiveness of the region, which is still true. Um, and we were trying to say that, you know, money that you're not spending on energy and water is money you can invest otherwise in your country and invest in the city. And that still holds true, obviously. Um, we were also talking a lot about energy efficiency jobs that we would be bringing to the region, which um, we're fortunate enough in that there's, you know, been some recent reports on the number of energy efficiency, energy efficiency jobs and clean energy jobs in Pennsylvania. And we actually, our county here in Pittsburgh, even leads Philadelphia County um, in the number of energy efficiency jobs. Mm -hmm. So those are like the types of uh, things that we were focused on, just seeing that there's going to be a lot of new market and business opportunities for folks. Mm -hmm. And then really telling people that they were going to get a handle on this invisible thing that they hadn't been focused on that they should be focused on. Right. Um, because, you know, still today we meet with people when we're recruiting them who have never looked at an energy bill before. <laughs> Amazing. Which is crazy, right? I mean, it's crazy, it's crazy to yeah. me. But um, I, that's like, if somebody asked me what has been the most surprising thing about my job the last six months, that was definitely the most surprising thing. Um, yeah. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of businesses also have independently already have carbon goals or, you know, overall sustainability goals, even if they're not that quantitative. So contributing to that and then providing you know, free education and a, a networking opportunity for all these property managers that are really very much heads down at their own building um, and don't necessarily get connected with the larger system of what's happening here in the region. Mm -hmm. They love that, you know, like no one's really provided them that opportunity before. And it's shocking to me how many similarities there are between buildings and sectors that Seem to have no similarities whatsoever you know like when somebody says this like literally just happened somebody's looking to redo their life in their lobby but they're historic their pictures are, are historic so we connected them with 
uh, a local church that did it a couple years ago and actually had them sent somewhere to do this like special thing because they're historic they were historic as well so you know those are that's a 500 square foot building and a religious institution doing the same project right, right. Um, which is really cool. really interesting yeah, yeah. What about um, a behavior? Where do do businesses um, try to change the behavior of the part or of the participants in the biz in the buildings? Are you getting into that at all? Um, you know, we haven't really as much as I would love to. I actually just don't think we're really there yet. Like, there's still so much opportunity on things that they can really control that we haven't mm -hmm. focused on that very much. Um, especially because a lot of the folks that we have aren't necessarily owner operators, like they might just be building operators. So they don't necessarily have any control over the occupants. And basically they want to do whatever they can to save energy without annoying people and having them call them and be like, hey, my faucet isn't giving me enough water pressure. You know, they, they try to figure out <laughs> what, where the line is on turning down light levels and turning up, you know, HVAC set points and things like that. So they're doing a lot on the operational side as well. But um, understanding that in the end, like a lot of them have cu the, the people that are in their buildings are actually their customers. So they can't yeah. ask them to do too much. So you're not doing much with like green teams or that kind of thing. No, 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 we haven't. Um, actually, there's another organization in Pittsburgh that does that. So, that's, so in addition to not wanting to step on the toes of the private market, we don't want to have too much overlap. Well, we don't want to have overlap with other environmental nonprofits that are already doing stuff and doing it well. So here in Pittsburgh, we have Sustainable Pittsburgh, which does a Green Workplace Challenge. And that one is really focused on the businesses. Um, and on occupant behavior and things that they can control. So it's, it's kind of a really nice complimentary program and they know that market much better than we do. So we kind of let them handle that. One other question I have about your update report event. Do you offer any awards? Is that some, some kind of a motivational um, uh, draw for your, your building owners? You know what, we don't. We've talked about it. Um, we do that at GBA for like our annual fund fundraising event. And occasionally we will have like a 2030 partner that ends up in that mix. Mm -hmm. But no, we haven't. One thing that we do try to do though is when we see that there are opportunities for awards, we'll just nominate. Like we'll go to one of our property partners and be like, hey, we saw this award. Can we nominate you for this? Um, so like the, uh, the New York chapter of USGBC Urban Green Council used to hold, I don't think they, they didn't do them this year, but they would hold these existing building awards yeah. So we had property partners win those, I think, like three or four times because we just did the nominations for them. Um, we have also had one of our partners recently win a state level governor's award for environmental um, impact that we nominated them for. So we do try to get them recognition. Um, and definitely there's a lot of recognition that happens by them presenting at the partner meetings. But no, as far as awards go, we haven't. Mostly I don't really want to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> like I just don't want to have to deal with like giving one person an award instead we try to like hold them up in our partner meetings and by allowing them to, the platform to talk about the work they did rather than us try to select who's the who's the best right 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 <clears throat> well I think I so my questions do you have more Helene or Deborah? Yeah, I just have, I have one more question. Um, so do you have any examples of, you know, a business that has done really well by being part of the district? You know, either they've saved an amount of money or won an award or something like that. Yeah, we have a couple of those. Um, you know, to be honest with you, I'm, we're not great at documenting uh, and documenting it that way. And we need to get better about that. I think for the first, I know that now we've been around for four years. Um, and so hindsight is <laughs> everything. Sure. Uh, but, you know, for the first couple of years, we were just really just like out there trying to get recruit people, trying to get momentum. And like we didn't necessarily focus on those types of things, um, which obviously our funders would love to hear too. You know, instead mm -hmm. we do from time to time, we will get, um, you know, quotes from folks or uh, do a case study or two, but I would definitely like to do more of that um, because mm -hmm. I know that our impact has been pretty significant and I would like to also dig into our data more to understand how the folks that have been participating for four years 
how they measure up in comparison to their peers who just joined last year, for example, mm -hmm. um, and whether we can start to really pull out some trends. I mean, one thing that we do ask people to tell us is uh, during kind of an annual survey that we do is we ask them to tell us if they've connected with somebody else or considered a project um, because of one of our meetings or something that we told them. And I mean, the answer is just like a resounding yes. Like, okay. you know, one of the great things about about the whole 2030 district model is that because we're, we're in most cases asking people to undertake very capital intensive projects, but we're giving them till 2030 to do it, right? And so what we wanna do is equip the people with the information they need to make that right decision when that capital project comes up. Because it doesn't make sense to replace, to fully replace the chiller or you know all of your lights in your entire building. That might not pencil now, but there might be a time when it does because something is getting to failure. And so when, when that happens, we wanna make sure that they have the tools they need to, uh, to make the right decision. That's awesome. Totally makes sense. You've got such larger um, building owners, it sounds like, than we have in Tucson. In a yeah, well, you know, but there's, there's value. And, you know, I think one of the things, though, that I think, because I think I've talked a lot about successes, but one of the things that I don't think we have a good handle on still are the small commercial partners. Mm -hmm. um, they're hard, <laughs> right? Because they're, they're not just in the business of running buildings. Like they're, you know, they live upstairs, they own a business. Like it's, those are, those are tough. And we have some other organizations that we work with locally um, who do uh, like energy audits and things for them, but that's still a big opportunity. And actually when I say small commercial, I don't even just mean like 10,000 square feet. Like there are a lot of buildings that are 50,000 square feet that aren't paying attention to any of this at all. And we haven't really engaged with them yet. Right. So, you know, cause right. they don't necessarily have building staff. Like they don't have an operating engineer. They don't have a building operate, uh, building uh, automation system. So I still think that there's a lot on the table. It's just that stuff is very time intensive because you need to like really make those relationships with a ton of people to make impact. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Totally. So uh, can I assume that residential is not part of your focus at this time? It or, is not. It's or, not. Um, there's another organization in the city that focused on, on residential. So we let them do that. Okay. And we that do was, do multifamily. It, was that existing yeah. before you put together the launch or you launched in 12? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then can I just ask you quickly, um, how has sure. your PR and your social media, how has that driven the the message if it has yeah i think i think it's been great um you know i think the most active place that we have is our like linkedin page i mean we definitely um we piggyback on the gba stuff for a lot of that stuff like for like the twitter account and facebook and things like that but we do have a linkedin um page and then we also do a newsletter um, we try not to bombard people with that. Also, we don't have the time to be churning out a ton of content, but pretty much quarterly we'll do a newsletter. Um, and then GBA does one on a month or on a weekly basis. And we provide content for that. It's 2030 specific. So, um, again, we lean on GBA's resources because there, there is a communications director, there's a multimedia director. So they're able to handle a lot of that for us. And, you know, we're all in the same office. You know, I like sit beside them so I can be like, hey, here's this thing. Can you like tweet about that for me? Because <laughs> I don't do that. So, Got it. yeah. Nice. Great. Wow. We've gotten a lot today. Thank yeah. you so much. Oh, good. I'm glad. I was nervous I wasn't going to be able to help. So no. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> I've got two, two pages already filled of notes. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> uh, are you going to be at the um, meeting in San Francisco uh, at the end yeah. of Yeah. Oh, good. I'm going to be there. This is Linda. So maybe we can meet in person. Oh, wonderful. That would be great. I would love that. Yeah, I'm really excited. This is my first summit. So really looking forward to that. And, you know, we have a lot of things to uh, actually Quinn from our office has been who I mentioned, who I don't know that I stress enough, like how amazing my team is, which is really the reason why we're so successful. And, you know, specifically with Quinn, like keeping keeping all of it together. She's actually been um, doing a lot of the organization for the summit. She did like pretty much the curation of all the events. 
and, uh, you know, like solicited topics from people and put together a schedule and all that stuff to help support Stan in San Francisco. So um, there's a lot of good stuff. I did look over the list a bunch of times before it went to everybody. So, um, but yeah, I mean, always feel free to reach out. Like we're happy to help and do what we can uh, to assist you. Like, especially, you know, when you really start to get into the thick of things and you have some data questions, like I'm happy to put you in touch with Isaac. Um, who is like a real expert on all those types of things. He even was the one that developed our local water baseline and ran our Make My Trip to Our Transportation survey that we got like 20,000 responses for two years ago. So, whoa. Um, yeah, I know. Whoa. I was shocked. <laughs> yeah, that's I was a working big one. At, I know. I was working on that as a, uh, working at PNC. So, six or no, 5,000 of those responses were from me, were from PNC, but mm -hmm. so the other 15, though, were from somebody, so that's really exciting that that was oh. a thing that happened. Um, yeah, so we're looking to do that, run that again next fall. And what, what does that survey entail? Is that just looking at uh, water, energy, and transportation emissions? No, that's actually just for transportation. So it was a commuter okay. survey that we, we were targeting folks in within our district, but we did also get some people just that picked it up because we did advertising um, like in the paper, on bus shelters, all kinds of stuff to try to get folks to take the survey. Basically, the way that we set our transportation baseline was working with our local uh, metropolitan trip uh, planning organization who is responsible for funneling all the federal and state funding um, and every every you know region has one of those and so they're the one that hold the model of our region and that helps them set priority projects for funding so what we did is we had the model and I know I'm really getting in the weeds here but we had the model um, what they thought our commuting patterns were and then we ran a survey to figure out where those how those matched up and we found that the emissions um, from the survey versus their model were 24% lower. So there were a ton more people taking the bus, uh, biking and walking. And so the reason why, you know, I mean, obviously that's important for 2030 goals, but also what we were trying to do is help and better inform that, not, uh, that model. So the funding gets to the places that actually should be spent, not necessarily more highway funding, but like how do we do better mm -hmm. bicycle infrastructure and better um, and better uh, bus infrastructure and things like that. So. Yeah, that's so valuable. It's great. Yeah, so it was really, that was a fun process. Looking forward to doing that again. We learned a lot. Wow. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Angelica. This has been amazing. You've uh, answered a lot of questions for us and given us a lot of ideas. And um, thank you so much for uh, opting to stay in touch. We'll probably take you up on that offer. <laughs> oh, no problem at all. And Linda, I look. Are you the only one going? And we've got two uh, two other people from our exec committee uh, will be there. Oh, wonderful. Leaders. So, yeah, I'll look for you there. It'll be great to meet you. In great. Person. Yeah, that sounds great. So I'm looking forward to that. And yeah, don't hesitate to reach out if you have more questions. We're happy to help. And i um, really excited about Tucson coming on. You know, hopefully, do you guys have a timeline for going full district status? Or where Not are you yet. in your exploratory yeah. process? One reason we're doing all these interviews is we got a big planning day coming up a week from tomorrow. And so we'll probably be setting that <laughs> as a goal. Oh, great. Wonderful. Well, looking forward, I'll be following closely because I'll be rooting for you and anything we can do to help, just let us know, okay? Oh, well, I'm going to ask That's real awesome. quick before we sign off, Aunt Angela, uh, Aunt Angelica, if, do you have collateral material other than what's on the website to, that you use when you give presentations or, or your... You know what? Not really. We mostly use that progress report. That progress report is like our kind of bread and butter because not only does it show our annual performance, but it also has information in there about the district. And so, okay. you know, it was, I didn't realize how important that was going to be, but I have, you know, a half dozen with them are with me at all times because I'm always pulling them out when we're recruiting people or when we're just having, you know, a, a funding meeting or whatever that's been. So I guess, you know, my word of advice there would be, you know, even when, even before you have the data, having some kind of progress report that can also be used as a marketing tool mm -hmm. um, kind of 
serves dual purpose, so you're not doing two things, <laughs> has been really useful to us. Is that on on your website? I'm sorry, I, I looked. It is. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's yes, and you can see kind of the progression of how we got better at it because uh, we have four years of them now. So um, the first year is very, very basic, and then it kind of goes on from gets you know more robust every year. So great, great, wonderful, awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, we really appreciate your time, and we'll look forward to seeing you in August. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank have you.